Hello everyone, my name is Kate and you are here for a webinar, webinar on good health before pregnancy. Uh, I'm a women's health nurse practitioner and I work with Pacific Reproductive Services, a intrauterine insemination clinic in Pasadena, California. I'm also affiliated with Fairfax Cryobank. Uh, there are, uh, there should be a bar or a window that you can type in questions. You can start typing in questions right away. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will go over all those questions. The ones we can't get to, hopefully we can post some answers to the website. So let's begin. All right, again, my name is Kate Wisda. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner and I work with Pacific Reproductive Services, an intrauterine insemination clinic in Pasadena. This is our website, and this is the Fairfax Cryobank website. And that's me. So we have some webinar goals in determining how to have a healthy pregnancy and how to access Cryobank website. And see, first we're gonna understand the preconception exam. Now, the preconception exam is extremely important. We'll go over all the details of that so you feel prepared. And um, second, we will talk about a healthy weight, diet, and exercise, and how weight can really benefit your, both your fertility as well as your pregnancy. Uh, three, consider lifestyle modifications, and we'll talk about those lifestyle modifications in detail. All of these things will help you maximize your fertility and hopefully reduce some pregnancy risks. So it's time to take a poll. How prepared for pregnancy do you feel? So it looks like we have 66% who say they are medium prepared, 21% not feeling ready yet, and then 13% are very prepared. Okay, so that is something we can definitely fix today. I've got a lot of information to share, and hopefully I can be of some assistance. So let's move on. Okay, so step one is your preconception exam. Your preconception exam is your pre-pregnancy checkup. Now this is important for every single woman to do. Every single one of you should see your doctor before you start trying to get pregnant. Um, you're just gonna go up to your doc and say, hey doc, I've decided I wanna get pregnant. Can you help me game, game plan this? Can you make sure that I'm healthy enough to get pregnant? And you can go to your primary care provider or you can go to your OBGYN. I personally think OBGYN is your best bet, but if you have a good relationship with your primary care provider, then go for it. Definitely let them know that you're ready to get pregnant. If you have a good relationship with both, then let both of them know. Uh, if you have a pre-existing condition that requires you to have a specialist, such as a cardiologist, endocrinologist, or even a psychiatrist, it's very important to set an appointment with them so that you can sit down and talk about what's going on and um, how to have your healthiest pregnancy. Uh, why do you want a pre-pregnancy checkup? You want to determine that pregnancy is a healthy choice for you. You want to identify factors that may affect your pregnancy. You want to increase your chances of having a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Our preconception, preconception exam checklist. First, you're going to do a lot of labs. We'll go over those labs, screenings and checks. We know all about screenings such as pap smears. We'll go over that medications and vitamins. We'll talk about creating a list and why we wanna talk about medications and vitamins. And then last, we'll talk about past pregnancies and how those can affect current and future pregnancies. So infectious disease. Even if you've been married for 20 years and you know you've never strayed and your partner's never strayed, you're going to get tested for infectious disease. It's just a good standard of care, and that will include HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. That is something that should be covered by your insurance. Um, it should be something that either your primary care or your OBGYN can order for you. And it's usually a lab draw. It'll be one or two vials and then chlamydia gonorrhea can be a vaginal swab or urine sample. 
uh, we want to know your blood type, your RH factor. So everyone knows that you can be A, B, O, but what we really want to know is if you're positive or negative. And it will be important in this current pregnancy as well as preventing any complications in future pregnancies. And your doctor will take that RH factor into consideration. Uh, next, we have immunity and vaccines. So rubella and varicella. Your primary care should know to test you for your immunity for rubella and varicella. Um, your OBGYN will definitely know that you should be checked for your immunity for rubella and varicella. If you've been vaccinated for rubella as a baby, it's likely that you won't need a vaccination uh, later in life, but that you'll, you'll come up positive for being immune to rubella. And varicella, which is chickenpox, whether you've had chicken pox or you've been vaccinated as a child, it's likely that you'll need a booster at some point in your life. If you get rubella or varicella when you're pregnant, you'll probably have a mild infection, you may experience a rash, but it can have very dire consequences on the pregnancy as well as the fetus. So it's important to get checked to make sure that you're immune to rubella and varicella. If you're not, you can get your vaccinations, you wait about a month, and then you can start trying to get pregnant. Influenza, you can definitely get your flu vaccine. Uh, tetanus is a good one. And Tdap is something that is usually given during pregnancy when you're pregnant, um, but your provider might wanna give it beforehand. Fertility, during your preconception exam, when you're meeting with your doc, you may wanna talk about fertility. If you're over the age of 35, you're in advanced maternal age, it's a good idea to talk to your doctor about your fertility. First off, your thyroid directly affects your fertility. It will help you determine whether or not, you can, I'm sorry, you can get a, a test TSH or free T4, and that will let us know if your thyroid is functioning normally. If it's high or low, then you might want to take medication or get treatment and postpone trying to get pregnant until it's normalized. Anti-malarian hormone. This is a big one at PRS, at Pacific Reproductive Services. Uh, Anti-malarian hormone is able to determine your egg reserve. So if you're born with all the eggs that you're ever going to have and they sit in your ovaries, they excrete a hormone called anti-malarian hormone. Each month, we, we lose one of those eggs. We menstruate it out. Um, what remains is going to secrete a certain amount of AMH. If you have a low AMH, then you have low fertility or a low number of eggs. If you have a high AMH, then you have many eggs left and your fertility is good. So it's important to get that checked out if you're over the age of 35. It'll give you an idea of maybe even how long it'll take to get pregnant. So it may, it may take several cycles of IUI, or it may take a couple years of having timed sex with your partner, or you may even have a low AMH and you want to go straight to IVF. So really it can save you time and money in, a, in the long run. And then we have a little graph over here that talks about the numbers for AMH, high, normal, low, and severely low. Severely low would be IVF. And in fact, looking at these numbers, low would also be IVF. Something like normal or high, intrauterine insemination would be a good option, or timed sex. Preconception exam screenings and checks. So we all know that we need a pap smear. Uh, the, the recommendations have changed. It's no longer every year for most people. It's typically every three to five years. Um, go with whatever your, your OBGYN has recommended. Um, so if you need to get a pap smear, it's a good idea to have that done at your preconception exam. Uh, it's also good if you're over the age of 40 to consider having a mammogram. You also want to check pre-existing conditions such as fibroids. Um, here we have a graph. It shows you where fibroids can grow. They're just these tissue growths that can grow inside the uterus or outside the uterus. Uh, if you've been diagnosed with fibroids in the past, maybe five years ago, you had a small fibroid. It's a good time during your preconception exam to talk to your doctor about that and say, hey, I want to know if that fibroid has grown and I want to know where it is. Is it going to impede the growth of the fetus or is it hanging out on the outside and it's not going to cause much problem? The reason we want to know this as well as getting a mammogram, if you, if you see the little estrogen after fibroids and after mammogram, 
So fibroids are fed by estrogen. They're, they're caused to, to grow with estrogen. And mammograms, most breast cancers, are mediated by estrogen as well. So estrogen will cause that breast cancer to grow. So if you are due for a mammogram or you're due to have your fibroid checked, it's a great idea because when you become pregnant, your estrogen level is gonna skyrocket and it will cause them to grow. We wanna know by how much and is that going to be significant. If you get a mammogram done and you are diagnosed with breast cancer, you wanna treat that before you start trying to get pregnant. Um, so that's, that's a good discussion to have with your provider. If you've never been diagnosed with fibroids, then you don't need to get a, a sonogram to find out if you have fibroids. It's not necessary, only if you have a history or if you have a family history, actually. Um, a lot of things like fibroids, they tend to run in families. Uh, check pre-existing conditions, diabetes, hypothyroid, hypertension. Now, it's important to have a game plan. Can you have a healthy pregnancy and be diabetic? Absolutely. But your doctor wants to make sure that your sugars are under control before you start trying. And then they will watch you very closely during your pregnancy to make sure that your sugars are under control. This will help prevent a number of risks to yourself, to the fetus, and to the baby once it's born. Uh, same thing with hypothyroid. If you're taking levothyroxine, which is a treatment for hyperthyroid, you may need to increase your dose. And uh, hypertension with high blood pressure, whatever medication you're taking now might not be uh, compatible with pregnancy. Your doctor might want to switch you to a new medication and then watch and make sure that that medication on what dosage they've prescribed is good for you. So they might switch you to labetalol, and then they wanna watch you for three months to make sure that that dosage of labetalol is good for you. Um, and then as you get pregnant, so many things in your body will change. They'll continue to watch you and make sure that that's the right medication for you. Uh, during your preconception exam, your doctor is gonna ask you a ton of questions about genetic disorders. They wanna know if something like sickle cell runs in the family, cystic fibrosis, or even mental retardation. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists now recommends that we get checked for three genetic disorders before we try to get pregnant. That would be cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, and fragile X. Fragile X is linked to uh, certain forms of mental retardation as well as autism. So it should be covered by your insurance. Uh, because ACOG or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists now recommends it. So have that conversation with your doctor uh, and find out if that's something for you. That can be another way to uh, prevent disease in the baby as well as uh, prevent any risks associated with pregnancy. Okay, preconception exam, medications and vitamins. Make a list and bring it with you. I would highly recommend that you write down all your vitamins, all your medications, and bring it into your doctor. So your doctor usually knows what medications you're taking, but they don't always know what vitamins you're taking. A lot of us are taking vitamins to um, prevent us from getting sick. We don't want to expose ourselves to COVID or anything else that might weaken our immune system right now. So a lot of us are taking vitamin C, mushroom supplements. Write all that down. Let your doctor know what you're trying, um, what you're taking. So medications, some medications can be harmful to your fetus. We know that it can cause, uh, medications can cause birth defects, pregnancy loss, premature delivery, infant death, or developmental disability disabilities. Now, few medications have been tested for safety in pregnancy or breastfeeding. Uh, I read maybe five years ago, I read an article that said something like 19% of all medications have been tested to be safe or have been tested for safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding. So it's good to talk to your doctor about what you're taking and should you continue to take it. Um, there is something called an FDA pregnancy category. For, for drugs. Um, I'm just gonna go over this, this with you. The, the categories are A, B, C, D, and X. A means that there's no fetal risk in controlled studies. So that medicine has been tested and we know that it's absolutely fine to take. B means that for you, it, it typically would mean something like Tylenol. So do I need to take this Tylenol? Do I have to take it? Do I have a migraine? Do I have a horrible headache and I can't go to work? 
and it's, it falls into a category B, well, then that might be your choice, whether or not you want to take that medicine. Uh, category C is usually something you want to talk to your provider about. D is evidence of risk to human fetus. You do not want to take that. Um, that's kind of a life or death situation if you want to take a, a category D. And then X is contraindicated in pregnancy. That would be something like, um, gosh, I don't know, morphine, something that you would not want to take during pregnancy. Uh, and we go down to vitamins here. You want to start taking your prenatal vitamin at least three months before you start trying to get pregnant. The reason is that we want to build up your folic acid stores. Uh, folic acid needs to be very high in the body. Having adequate folic acid can help prevent defects, uh, neural tube defects, which are defects in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, in the first four weeks of pregnancy, uh, our organs develop, and that is the absolute most important time to have a high level of folic acid. So start taking those prenatal vitamins at least three months before trying to get pregnant, ideally something more like six months. Uh, if you're taking any extra vitamins, let your doc know. If you're taking herbs like maca root or chaseberry, now these are very common um, for women trying to boost their fertility. And I I don't doubt that they work, they tend to, to work very well, um, but they're the kind of thing that you need an herbalist or an acupuncturist who is an herbalist to oversee your taking of these. I would not um, read an article or read a blog and then start taking maca root or chaseberry. They can have um, very serious effects on your cycles. Uh, something like maca root needs to be taken six months before you decide to get pregnant. Chased berry, make sure you tell your doctor chased berry can um, cause fertility meds to not work, to be less effective. So make sure you have that discussion with your provider. Next, we have preconception exam past pregnancies. So some pregnancy problems have a higher risk of repeating in succeeding pregnancies. That's preterm birth, high blood pressure, preeclampsia, and gestational diabetes. So if you've had any of these in prior pregnancies, you have a higher risk of seeing that again in this current pregnancy or the pregnancy that you're trying for right now. So we aim to reduce risk with proper care before, during, and after your pregnancy. For example, we, we talked about your sugars being, un, being controlled. So if you're diabetic, you wanna make sure your sugars are well controlled. Well, if you have a history of gestational diabetes, you might want to start out by changing your diet and, and switching um, to a more healthy diet, a fresher diet, before you start trying to get pregnant to prevent gestational diabetes. Your doctor might also want to check your A1C, your sugars, before you even start trying. And probably your OB will check your your sugars very early in the pregnancy and more frequently during the pregnancy, so as to prevent gestational diabetes. Resources. So we'll show this slide again, but I think the resources are your most important tool. Um, CDC.gov, Treating for Two, is a fantastic website. Uh, Womenshealth.gov is a government website. I'm always surprised at how easily it reads and how up-to-date it is. It's a really fantastic website. And then of course, ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, I find that that is a little bit better for providers to read, but as a patient, you're more than welcome to look up their resources for patients. They tend to get a little wordy. I think CDC and womenshealth.gov are your best resources. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about our second goal, which is pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, and weight. So weight and fertility are very much related. So if you're trying to get pregnant and, you're, um, and you're, you fall into a category that might be overweight or obese, it's important to know that that can affect your fertility and then that can make it harder for you to get pregnant. Uh, so here we have a body mass index on the right side, a body mass index, uh, gosh, graph, um, it lets you know whether, based on your height and your weight, if you are at a risk, a higher risk of disease or having pregnancy complications. Um, so if you're a healthy weight, say you're 5'4 and you're 110 pounds, you fall into a healthy weight. If you're 5'4 and you're 140 pounds, 
you still fall into a healthy weight. But when you get up to 150 pounds, you might be considered overweight. And as you go along, it goes into obese. On the left side, we talk about relative risk of infertility versus BMI. So for every box you go up in BMI, for every number you go up in BMI, you start to increase your risk of infertility, okay? The body is in a place where it's not stable, where maybe your sugars are out of control, or maybe just your body functioning is, is not as adequate as it could be, and your body knows not to get pregnant. So if you, let's say you have a BMI, if you look at the bottom here, you have a BMI of 30, 32. 30 is at the very top of overweight, and it falls into the obese category as well. And you can see they've created a relative risk, zero to four, on this graph on the left. Um, having a BMI of 30 to 32, puts you at the highest risk of infertility here. So losing weight can be very important to not only having a healthy pregnancy, but getting pregnant in the first place. I'll go to our next slide. Excess weight during pregnancy can increase the risk of high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and preterm birth. For, for those who don't know, preeclampsia is a potentially dangerous pregnancy complication. It's characterized by high blood pressure, and there can also be organ damage um, indicated by protein in the urine and uh, pretty severe swelling in the body. Um, it's definitely something we want to avoid in pregnancy. Obesity during pregnancy increases the risk of macrosomia. Macrosomia is a consequence of uncontrolled gestational diabetes, where the baby can be uh, larger than it should be, which can cause a lot of damage to the mother during birth and can cause something called shoulder dystocia, can cause spraining or even breaks in the shoulders of the baby as the baby's coming out of the birth canal during birth. So macrosomia is, is something we want to avoid. Uh, obesity during pregnancy it also increases the risk of birth injury, uh, risk of cesarean birth, birth defects such as uh, heart defects and neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are defects in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and again, with obesity, you also have the risk of high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and preterm birth. Um, underweight is also a concern. We, of course, will focus more on overweight because that tends to be the more common issue in our society. Uh, underweight does increase the risk of low birth weight in the fetus. So you'll have a, a fetus that is smaller than, than we would hope for, problems during delivery and preterm birth. But there's definitely something you can do about those risks. We want to minimize those risks. So losing weight is something that your doctor will talk to you about during your preconception exam. Do you need to lose weight? Are you overweight or are you obese? And whether or not you should take some time and lose weight before trying to get pregnant. Losing even a small amount of weight can improve your overall health and the health of your pregnancy. Uh, implement high healthy diet and exercise six months before trying to conceive. Now there's an asterisk on this six because that's my recommendation. I couldn't find a recommendation from uh, CDC or ACOG. So I think six months beforehand, trying to change your diet, eat a healthier diet and exercise more often most days of the week is a great way to build a very healthy body and to set you up for a healthy pregnancy. Uh, avoid diets while trying to conceive. Please, please, please don't do a keto diet. Keto diet is just, I would say, absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. You need your sugars when you're pregnant. Your baby is going to live almost entirely off of those sugars. And if you do a keto diet, you're gonna be minimizing the sugars or the glucose in your body. It's gonna cause a lot of complications. It also puts your body into a state of stress. Um, and the reason I recommend not doing keto is because I've tried keto and I know the state of stress it puts your body in. Uh, other diets like cabbage soup diet, where you eat cabbage soup twice a day for two meals or three meals, uh, it's just not healthy. Diet pills are an absolute no, and I personally recommend avoid sugar, sugar substitutes. We don't quite know the implications on pregnancy and on the growing fetus. Uh, you're definitely not going to be able to diet while you're pregnant. That's not okay to do. So doing it pre-pregnancy is a great idea. 
Discuss with your OB how much weight you can safely gain during your pregnancy. You can talk to your OB during the preconception exam as well as during your first OB visit. If someone is obese or overweight, then they would need to gain less weight during their pregnancy. So the recommended amount is typically 25 to 35 pounds. If you're obese or overweight, uh, you're looking at something more like 20, 25 pounds is the recommended amount. And it's important to stick to those goals. And those goals can help prevent risk. So pre-pregnancy diet and exercise. I think we all know how to eat healthy, but here's just a couple, idea, couple ideas. Heavy on the fruit and vegetables, moderate on the whole grains and legumes, light on the dairy and current pregnancy, as well as preventing animal fats, salts, and added sugars. And of course, always aim for fresh foods versus stable, shelf-stable foods. Exercise. So whatever you did before, you can do after. It's an old adage, and it's one that I uh, definitely believe in, and that's what I recommend for my patients. Uh, I had a friend who, when she got pregnant, decided that she was not going to allow her, her heart rate to get over 150 when she was exercising. I don't know where she got that number. I don't think that that's uh, a major concern. Everyone has a different resting heart rate. I don't think you can put a number on it. Um, so if you, if you run five miles every morning uh, while you're trying to get pregnant, you can run five miles. Your body does very well at that. And those adrenaline, those, those good benefits are just going to help you get pregnant. Um, and it's the same with when you are pregnant. Definitely talk to your OB about what they recommend you do, but I'm a big believer in you continuing with your exercise as long as you feel good, as long as there are no aches or pains, as long as your body is happy doing it. The American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity. Uh, Moderate and vigorous, of course, depending on your current state of health. Um, greater amounts of exercise will provide even greater health benefits. If you want to know more about this, you can go to www.heart.org and learn about the recommendations from the American Heart Association. Um, so a healthy heart, strong muscles, a healthy metabolism contribute to a healthy pregnancy, easier birth, and an easier recovery. So it, it really behooves you to implement a, an exercise and diet that is beneficial for your body. It will also be beneficial for your baby. Having a healthy baby means that your baby will have a healthy life, right? Uh, and always, like I said, check with your OB once you're pregnant. They may have uh, different recommendations based on your health history or um, your current lifestyle. Pre-pregnancy lifestyle modification. So implement healthy diet and regular exercise. We talked about that. Lose or gain weight as needed. And then of course, stopping unhealthy substances. So the, the one question I hear all the time is caffeine. Um, I put this graph up. I don't particularly like this graph. I had a really hard time finding graphs that were similar. A lot of them suggest that instant coffee has more caffeine, brewed coffee has le less caffeine, green tea has more caffeine. The, the point of this graph is that anything under 200 milligrams is okay. You can have under 200 milligrams of coffee a day when you're trying to get pregnant. It's not linked to intrauterine growth restriction. Um, there's a few ideas that higher than that, more than 200 milligrams a day can cause complications in pregnancy, but nothing has quite been proven at this point. Um, marijuana has been linked to attention and behavioral problems in children, risk of stillbirth, and low birth weight. Uh, opioid abuse has been linked to preterm birth, stillbirth, poor fetal growth, and poor placental growth. Smoking and tobacco, there is not enough time in the day. There is, I don't have enough energy to explain how bad smoking is during pregnancy. So quit smoking today. Give your body some time to repair, give it at least a couple months to repair, and then start trying to get pregnant. Alcohol. So pre-pregnancy, while you're trying, the recommendation is none to minimal. So if you have a half a pint of beer um, once a month while you're trying to get pregnant, that will 
unlikely be the cause of your not getting pregnant. It's probably going to be just fine for your body. Um, again, the, the best recommendation, of course, would be to avoid alcohol altogether. Pre-pregnancy lifestyle modifications. So keep your home safe from lead, mercury, fertilizer, pesticides, solvents, radiation, and cat or rodent poop. So toxoplasmosis is something that is associated with cat or rodent poop. Uh, so you don't want to change the kitty litter. Your partner gets to change the kitty litter. Uh, some people actually will, um, I don't know how to, well, they will get rid of their cat for <laughs> the time that they're trying to get pregnant or while they are pregnant and maybe their sister will take their cat for a year and a half and then when they're, they have their baby, then they'll take the, the cat back. Um, but toxoplasmosis is a very uh, potentially serious disease uh, during pregnancy. So uh, your partner is absolutely safe to change your kitty litter, but you should stay away from it. Uh, watch out for dangers in your workplace. Some jobs like those that expose you to chemicals are or are physically difficult or dangerous may be risky before and during your pregnancy. So if you have a job that you think might be difficult when you are pregnant, it, it might be of you to have that conversation pre-pregnancy to say, I'd like to get pregnant. Is there any way we can change my job roles? And that may um, help you in the long run when you are pregnant. Food safety. So toxoplasmosis, we talked about that. Um, listeria is the main concern. Uh, there is a whole list of things not to eat while you're trying to get pregnant or while you are pregnant. Uh, raw seafood, such as sushi is a good one to avoid. Uh, soft cheeses, uh, unpasteurized milk, uh, undercooked eggs, those are good ones to avoid to prevent listeria. So we know that um, there's this little bubble right here above the lady and the, and the fetus. These foodborne illnesses can infect your baby even if you do not feel sick. So oftentimes if we come in contact with E. coli or listeria, we might have um, a little bit of diarrhea, or we might feel nauseous, but it can have very serious consequences on the baby. Um, so this is something to take into consideration and something that's very easy to Google online. All right, lastly, we're gonna talk about our pre-pregnancy planning checklist. Uh, so first off, we talked about taking prenatals and how important it is to take prenatals with folic acid. Uh, at least three months before you start trying. Drink lots of water. If you are someone who drinks zero water, then you're gonna make an effort to drink two small water bottles a day. If you're someone that drinks plenty of water, you're gonna keep doing that. Um, you just really, I always tell my patients, you, you do the best. You made it through life this far drinking zero water. Just try to up your water intake and um, just do your best. Stop drinking alcohol, that's a good one. Reduce caffeine intake. Uh, Quit smoking. Not enough time in the day to explain how to quit or why you should quit smoking for pregnancy, but please, please quit smoking. Stop recreational drugs and uh, check with your doctor with medications and over the counter drugs, as well as vitamins and supplements. Uh, remember, we talked about make that list, bring it in, just show it to your doc, uh, and they can, they can scroll right through it and let you know which one you should keep taking or stop taking. Start an exercise routine. Exercise, exercise, exercise. It can make for an easier birth, easy recovery, easier pregnancy. Uh, establish healthy, healthy eating habits. Do the best you can. Avoid fish, which is high in mercury. That's on that list that we've just looked at. Um, the recommendation is, I believe, to eat fish no more than once a week. Uh, when you're pregnant, try to eat it maybe a little bit less. Maintain healthy weight or BMI. Uh, we showed you the BMI category and it's direct link to uh, fertility. So if you have a, an elevated BMI, it's going to potentially be harder for you to get pregnant. Read what to expect before you're expecting book. I think what to expect before you're expecting is a great book to have and definitely what to expect when you're expecting. Fantastic book. Every pregnant woman should have that. Um, those are those are great, it's a great resource. Get the most up-to-date book. Um, if you're going on Amazon, make sure that you get the 2020 or the 2019 book. Preconception visit, 
I can't stress enough that this is your number one step. You're gonna to talk to your doctor and say, doc, I wanna get pregnant. How can I do it so that I can stay as healthy as I can and I can have a baby that's the healthiest, uh, happiest baby possible? And put a lot of that weight on your doctor. Let them know that you're relying on them and that you want to do everything needed. You wanna do all the labs, you wanna answer all the questions about genetic screening and um, have faith in your doctor to help you game plan a healthy pregnancy. Uh, get a physical, that will be part of your preconception visit. Sexual health checkup, again, part of your preconception visit, as well as cervical screen if you're due for one. Planning out money, that's a great one to consider. Plan out your career if that's something uh, you'd like to do. It's a big discussion with your spouse. It's important to know that you have support um, whoever your partner is, or if you're a single mother by choice, have that conversation with your best friend who really wants to babysit. Have that conversation with your parents um, that also want to babysit. Uh, make sure that you feel supported in your decision and in your plans to get pregnant. Uh, plan your home, uh, plan for a new car. If you've got a car that's maybe a very old convertible, maybe you want to get a nice uh, van, catch up on sleep. Sleep is very important. Uh, have health insurance, get life insurance. That's not something everyone has the opportunity to get, but if your work offers life insurance and you maybe declined it when you were first hired, now you get to call up HR and say, hey, remember that life insurance you offered me? Uh, go to the dentist. Your dental health relates to your whole body, your systemic health, so it's important to have healthy teeth. Discuss with your mental health provider. This is a big one. Definitely talk to your mental health provider if you have one. If you're currently taking psychiatric medications, talk to your doc. Say, you know what, is this healthy in pregnancy? What do I do if I wanna go off my meds? What kind of resources are available to me to help me cope while I'm reducing this, whatever dose of whatever medication you're taking? Um, pregnancy can be stressful and it's important to have support. Figure out your stress remedy is the next one. Absolutely minimize stress while you're pregnant. Uh, be happy, enjoy. Preventing, avoiding infections. We talked about the listeria and the toxoplasmosis with the kitty litter. Uh, lifestyle changes, avoid risks. If you have wild lifestyle, wild lifestyle, lifestyle um, maybe make it less wild. Stop using birth control. Um, so I left this one here. I thought this was good. Uh, Depo. If you're taking Depo, make sure that you go off your Depo. It can take anywhere from three months to a year to have your fertility come back. If you're using an IUD or you're using birth control pills, you can get pregnant immediately after taking those out. In fact, you probably have a better chance of getting pregnant right after you take that out because those will help to organize your hormones and help regulate you. So stop your birth control and know that you can get pregnant right away. Um, with the exception of Depo, have that conversation with your doctor. Figure out when you ovulate. There's ovulation predictor kits. You can always Google. Most women ovulate roughly around cycle day 14, but it's very different for every woman. Uh, talk to your mom about her past medical history. This is a great time to have that discussion with your mom. Uh, you might not know that maybe she had three miscarriages before she had your brother. Uh, having that conversation, we know that our GYN health uh, tends to be very related to our sisters and our mothers, um, even our grandmothers. So we want to know what they went through. There's a chance that we may also go through that. Um, and it's, it's a nice uh, opportunity to, to get some good mom advice. And of course, vaccinate for rubella, varicella, and influenza. There's your resources again, um, womenshealth.gov, love, love, love it. Finding a sperm donor. Uh, we have a number of webinars that you can listen to. How to choose a sperm donor is, is one of them. Uh, there's a link to the website. Choose your donor and place an order. You are now ready to start your journey. Our knowledgeable, friendly, helpful client service specialists are here to assist you. I cannot recommend client services enough. They are very knowledgeable. Um, my clients often use Fairfax Cryobank and we talk a lot about what client services can do for them and the questions that they can answer. They can talk about um, how many vials are left. 
they can help patients really plan out whether they want to do um, whether they want to pre-purchase for a second child just talk to client services and come with a list of questions they're very very helpful and we'll take the poll once more again after the webinar how prepared for pregnancy do you feel now i hope that this webinar has been helpful um, and i hope that you know that uh, it's important to have a preconception exam to talk to your doctor put a lot of weight on your doctor and say doc help me game plan help me figure out how healthy um, i can be to get pregnant um, how to improve my fertility and then also take into consideration your weight and whether or not you need to lose weight or gain weight and uh, try to minimize outside infections. We're seeing great, great responses on the poll. 65% say they now feel ready with 35% saying more medium prepared. Great, 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 great. Okay, time for Q&A. Hi everyone, thanks for submitting all of your questions. We have a lot of them, a lot of great questions. So we'll go through them um, and have Kate, as well as Christy Burke, who is on the line from Client Services, um, answer any questions. If we do not get to all of them, we will be putting them into a blog post afterwards. So feel free just to keep submitting your questions. We'll do our best to get through some right now. So this first one's for you, Kate. It says, are there any special health tips for women conceiving a over age 40? Yes, absolutely. So number one, health tips, check your fertility, check your fertility, check your fertility. So find out what your AMH is. And we talked about this earlier in the webinar. AMH is anti-malarian hormone. Um, and as I explained, you're born with all the eggs you're ever going to have, and each month you'll menstruate out one of those eggs, maybe even two of those eggs, and by the time you're 40, you want to know how many eggs you have left. If you have a lot of eggs, you can, you can tell that your fertility is very high. If you have a low number for AMH, then you know that you have very few eggs left, and you also want to take into consideration the quality of those eggs. If they're low quality, you can be at risk for miscarriage. You want to know what you're getting into when you're trying to get pregnant um, over the age of 40. It's important to talk to your doctor about that. If you have a very low AMH, then spending the year having timed sex is, is not the best way to spend your time. Your fertility, any eggs left, and you're over the age of 40 or once it gets to a low AMH. So maybe you want to go straight to IVF and you've only got a year of fertility left and you want to just get that done right away. I think that is your best bet to talk to your doctor, find out your fertility and go from there. So that way you don't waste any time and there is no, there's no missed opportunities there. Um, another question for you. It's important to get that checked out before getting pregnant and then stop it when getting pregnant. I'm guessing this one <laughs> was probably before I talked about keto, but I have done keto myself and it puts you into, um, they actually call it keto sickness. So it puts your body into a very severe state of stress. Um, I, I would not, if, if you feel like that is your only way to lose weight and you want to do keto and then stop months before trying to get pregnant, okay, but that just seems a lot of up and down uh, stress on your body. Um, your, better, your best bet is to change your diet and change your exercise uh, because when you're pregnant, you don't want to go back to old patterns. That's going to, that's not going to benefit your pregnancy. If you're healthy for a little bit, stop and then stop and go back to old bad habits. Um, I would recommend trying to slowly implement a fresh diet and regular exercise. Um, and it, it's important to find exercise that's good for you, that makes you happy. If you like to dance, you're going to do Zumba. If you hate exercise, then you're going to you're going to drag your best friend on walks every night. Um, you just do the best you can. But I, I don't think that keto is the best way to approach it. And you might even want to talk to your doctor too. Sometimes insurances cover uh, visits with nutritional specialists or dietitians. That that might be something that's very helpful for you. How early should you stop drinking alcohol? How early? Um, 
gosh, I'm trying to think of what you mean. So you you actually, I always tell my patients that, like I said, you know, if you have a half a pint of beer while you're trying to get pregnant and you have it with a meal and you drink it slowly, I mean, something like that's not going to cause you not to get pregnant. Um, it's not going to affect your fertility. And it's very unlikely it'll affect your pregnancy. Um, but it, it really depends on you and how comfortable you are. Now, if you're going out every weekend and you're binge drinking, I would give yourself a few months of sobriety, maybe three months. It's probably all you need um, to get your body back in order. Uh, that, if you drink a lot and you drink regularly, that can be an indication of just poor lifestyle choices, um, which I would say three to six months of um, doing what you know you should do, <laughs> stopping that heavy drinking. And we got a couple questions about prenatal vitamins. Someone yeah. wants to know if you have a recommended one. And then they also said, is it okay to change prenatal vitamins during the six months before getting pregnant? Okay, so the second question, is it okay to change prenatal vitamins? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, even when someone's pregnant, you can change your prenatal vitamins. Um, there's a lot of nausea in early pregnancy, so a lot of women will switch their prenatals till they find one that's good for their stomach. Um, I always recommend doing the gummies, bite off the head for breakfast and then eat the butt for dinner, and then you get your prenatal and you don't have nausea. Uh, it, as far as brands go, I absolutely cannot tell you. Um, I, when I was in school, I worked with a number of obstetricians and they never, they always said, any brand you want, just pick a brand, any brand. So the, the jury's kind of out on that. Um, and patients ask me all the time, there really is no one brand that I would say is uh, particularly better than the others. I think if you aim for whole food vitamins, um, they tend to be good. Uh, I've also heard, um, well, yeah, it, it depends also on your finances too. There is one key ingredient in prenatals that I would highly recommend. It's called DHA, D as in dog, H, A. DHA is an omega acid and that will help prevent uh, neural tube defects. Uh, so the brain and the spinal cord as it's developing, it will help prevent any issues with the developing brain and the spinal cord. Same with folic acid. So if, um, if you now know that DHA is a key ingredient, when you go to the store, you'll see it everywhere. Uh, you'll see prenatals plus DHA, and then some that don't say plus DHA, if you look on the back of them, you'll actually see that there's DHA in there. Um, if you love your prenatal and you wanna add a DHA supplement, you can absolutely do that. Um, uh, Nordic Naturals is a brand that I would recommend. They are very low in mercury. Um, they're really the only Omega brand that I would recommend. and um, they they can get a little bit costly, but it's a very high quality product. And I believe the recommended dosage is something like 200 milligrams. But if you check on the back of your prenatals, it'll let you know what a recommended dosage is for daily use. Um, if you're seeing a fertility doctor, the preconception exam should have already been administered. Should I see an OB or a PCP? Yes. Okay, so if you're still if you're seeing a fertility doc and they did a preconception exam on you um, and they drew all your blood and they did um, the HIV screening, they did all those infectious diseases, um, maybe they also offered you a pap smear if you needed a pap smear. I would still, depending on your health history, if you don't really have any problems, you don't really have anything going on, and you've already had that infectious disease and the pap smear has been offered and all that, then you, yeah, you don't need to go see your primary care. Um, but if you have anything going on or a history of anything, let's say you have a history of anemia, seeing your primary care provider, they're gonna draw something called a CBC, a complete blood count. They're, they're gonna wanna see if you're still anemic. We don't want you to be anemic when you're trying to get pregnant. Um, and maybe your fertility doctor didn't consider drawing that because they don't know your history. So it's important to, um, of course, give a good history to your fertility doctor, but if you have anything going on or a history of anything, I would recommend seeing your primary care or your OBGYN. It should be covered by an insurance as well as just a, you know, a well visit. Um, speaking about doctors, someone wants to know who they should ask about the vaccines. They have a fertility doctor and an OB that is going to do their IUI. Yeah. And they also have a, pre, a PCP as well. Yeah, good question. 
So th that's a little bit tricky. Uh, each doctor's office is going to do different things. Um, if you say go to Kaiser, you can ask anyone. So your fertility doc, your OBGYN, your primary care, they all have access to those vaccines. But if you go to a small clinic where there's uh, with your OBGYN, they might not have those vaccines on hand, but uh, they may refer you to your primary care. So um, I don't have a good answer for that, but just kind of bring it up with each of them. If the first one you see, if the first doctor you see is your fertility, then say, hey, do you guys have vaccines on site? Can you give me vaccines? Um, then they'll let you know. Otherwise, you know, primary care OBGYN is your best bet. Sorry, it's really just a matter of ask as recommended um, what they would recommend for you. And, and who has your, your most complete history, health history? If you've been with your primary care for 20 years, but you've been with your OB for six months, then you might want to go to primary care. So another person wants to know, what if you don't have six months before your first IVF cycle, you have six weeks, but you don't, you haven't been active and you want to start a new routine. Is it too late to try to get moving in new ways? No, not at all. It's never too late. Um, I'm so happy that you're doing IVF. That's wonderful. So you've um, you started that process. That's great. I would absolutely talk to your fertility specialist and the doctor that you're working with. They're going to have great recommendations that can be tailored to you. Um, simply going out every day and taking a long walk is a great way to exercise. Um, implementing more fresh foods into your diet is a great way to be healthy. Um, like I said early in the webinar, even losing a very, very small amount of weight can have huge impacts on, on your health. So even just making small changes in your diet or exercise without actually losing those numbers can have great changes in your health. So talk to your fertility specialist, ask them, you know, I, I want to make some changes. What can I do? What do you think would be best for me? Um, they may take any pre-existing conditions into consideration, or maybe you have something else like you live in a city or you live in a rural environment. They'll give you some good ideas. Is BMI relative to race? Is BMI relative to race? That's a really good question. Um, I would say no. And, and, that's, and that's tricky. So BMI is a number. BMI takes a person in the world with all their experience and all their greatness and puts them into a number and tells them if they're going to be happy and healthy, if they're going to be sad and sick. And that's just really not how human beings work. So if, let's say you're a bodybuilder, um, your BMI is going to make you look like you're obese. You're not obese. You just have a lot of muscle. You're extremely healthy. So BMI is, is a, what do we say, a grain of salt. Um, you, you take it as it relates to you and to your life, but you do not boil down to a number. Um, it's just a guide, just to let you know, you know what, maybe your life isn't, your lifestyle isn't as healthy as it could be. Um, so take that as, as uh, a push in the right direction. Um, but no, I, I would not say that it's, it's quite relative to race, but I mean, that, that might be something that's worth looking up and seeing if there's been any studies. That's an interesting question. Here's another question, Kate, for you. When taking medications for transfer, FET medications include progesterone and oil and estradiol. Should you follow a pre-pregnancy diet or a pregnancy diet? Can you, can you repeat the question just one more time? So when taking medications for the transfer for FET, should she follow a pre-pregnancy diet or a pregnancy diet? So a pre-pregnancy diet is pretty similar to a pregnancy diet. Um, your diet should not change that much. If you feel like the hormones are making you hungrier or you feel like you're getting mood swings or cravings, then I would talk to your fertility doctor about it. But there really shouldn't be much of a difference between pre-pregnancy as in uh, trying to get pregnant that should be the same healthy diet as your pregnancy diet. But yeah, check with your fertility doctor if you're having um, any sort of cravings or any issues with food related to the medication. Another person wants to know about endometriosis stages. Which one is more suitable to get pregnant and which one is less to get pregnant? Okay, so endometriosis, um, gosh, I kind of want to go back to that picture.
Sorry, just bear with me until I get there. It's such a good picture. Endometriosis can occur in different places. We're going to go back to the fibroid picture, even though endometriosis and fibroids are different things. Okay, so um, endometriosis can occur in a number of places. Um, there's different stages. Uh, endometriosis usually occurs in the ovaries, uh, but it can occur in other places in the body. Um, whether or not that affects your fertility or your pregnancy is something that you want to talk to your doctor about. Plenty of people have endometriosis and it doesn't affect their fertility, but some people do have problems with egg quality and endometriosis. Uh, your doctor might want to give you um, some doses of an antioxidants. They might want to even give you some fertility medication. So have that discussion with your doctor. Um, very, very good question. Should male partners also quit smoking? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> they should also quit smoking. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to tell your partner what to do. Um, but yes, uh, secondhand smoke is very serious and can have consequences uh, for you. And if there's consequences for your body, there's consequences for the baby. Um, yeah, I, I would recommend that your partner quit. Is there a healthy way to gain weight? A healthy way to gain weight, yes. So. Um, I'm glad that this question came up. I know that the focus is always on losing weight, but there is definitely a healthy way to gain weight. Um, just as, as, so we talk a lot about losing, losing weight and how you don't want to lose more than, you know, so many pounds in a week. It's the same with gaining weight. You want to make sure that you're eating healthy, um, healthy fats, lean fats, uh, and you want to gain weight slowly. So if you ate, fast food every day and you ate it five times a day, then you would probably gain weight pretty quickly, but it would not be the weight gain that you want. Um, exercise is also important while you're trying to gain weight. You wanna build muscle. You wanna take those nutrients that you take in and build muscle, uh, lean muscle um, and, and gain strength. Like we said, that, that strength will help with the pregnancy, the delivery and the recovery. Uh, if you're trying to gain weight, uh, there's a really good chance that your insurance is going to cover your meeting with a dietitian. I would highly recommend uh, doing that and talking to someone. It's important to have the kind of conversation that uh, takes your lifestyle into consideration, uh, the hours that you work, whether or not you're in the car all the time. Uh, we want to figure out how you can get the healthiest foods possible um, as often as possible while taking your lifestyle into consideration. So meeting with a professional is, is a really good idea. Great, here's another question. It says, um, how to find out if you're CMV negative? Oh, just a simple lab draw. You can go to your doc and have them check. Um, CMV is something, it's called cytomegalovirus, for those who don't know. CMV is something that more than 50% of the population has been exposed to. Most people, from what I understand, are CMV positive. It's an infection that your body, excuse me, <laughs> dry throat, is that your body can take in and suppress without any problems. If you get um, active CMV while you're pregnant, it can have um, some dire consequences on the, on the pregnancy. CMV is considered uh, like an opportunistic infection. We saw it a lot when people were suffering from HIV and AIDS. Um, and we also know that your immune system is a little preoccupied while you're pregnant, so we want to avoid CMV. Um, it's, it's helpful to know if you're CMV positive before you start trying to get pregnant, um, but it's, it's really not, it, it is standard of care, but it's not gonna do a whole lot to change your lifestyle. CMV is not really something that um, we give recommendations for prevention. But yeah, just go to your primary care, your OBGYN, and they'll, they'll just do like a simple lab draw to find out your CMV. Great. So someone wants to know, they're currently not eating red meats and they're mostly eating fish and chicken. For pregnancy or trying to get pregnant, should they incorporate red meat back into their diet? Oh, uh, that depends on you. Uh, so we want you to eat lots of lean 
meats, um, including tofu, if that's your jam. Um, I don't see any problem with adding beef back to your diet. Um, I wouldn't eat it in excess, but beef can be very healthy for you. Yeah, if you want to implement it back into your lifestyle, definitely. Um, and, and consider adding other good protein sources, such as soy and uh, even quinoa, maybe some eggs. It's, it's good to get a well-rounded diet. Great. So last question here, there are a lot of uh, questions left. So like I said, we will be putting together a blog post wrapping up all of the questions that we didn't get to today. So the last question here, someone wants to know if we have any other future webinars planned. Um, and I just wanna let everyone know that we do have a webinar planned at the beginning of December. It will be a town hall opportunity for you to ask, ask a lot of questions. Um, to those who have been on the webinar in the past. So Michelle Adi, someone from Client Services, um, just our, our Director of Genetic Services, uh, Suzanne Seitz. So a lot of helpful people will be on the town hall webinar and it's a great opportunity for you to come with your questions. So look for that invite to come. Great. I, I did want, can I just say one more thing about the CMV? There's a great article on the Fairfax Cryobank website about CMV. Uh, I would highly recommend looking at it. I think it's under something like patient resources, patient information. Great. But yeah. Thank you all for, for listening to me ramble for all that time. Uh, you <laughs> are forget. greatly appreciated. Kate, can you go back one slide? Everyone, um, as you notice here, we are doing a free uh, full unlimited access so if you go here using the code Good Health Webinar, you'll save um, about 130 off of that full promo, or excuse me, full access package. It gets you unlimited access to all of the donor products on the donor profile. So this is great as you go through your donor search. Um, and as some of you noted in the question box, there is a typo there. This promo is good through the end of the month. So through November 30th, you'll be able to use this. So thank you everyone. Thank you.